When it comes to the Mets' first series of the season, I guess the one takeaway we can have is it uh, can't get any worse than that. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today. You'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. It's a fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. That is not how the Mets would like to start off their season. They get swept for the first time in their opening series since 2014. Their manager, Carlos Mendoza, serves a suspension before he wins a game. Just absolute disaster on all fronts. The Milwaukee Brewers outclass them all weekend long. It's very similar to when these two teams met early last season, where the Mets went into Milwaukee, if I'm not mistaken, and just got the pants beat off them. Scherzer got rocked at a start. It was a disaster last year. And this felt like a continuation of 2023. It, it was just the same frustrating, embarrassed feeling watching those games. There's no other way to describe it. You, you're watching and you have all the hope, right? All the off-season hope where people like me, and I, I'm going to raise my hand up and say, I told you to believe in this team. Maybe... I just was completely wrong because all off season I've tried to buy in. I tried to buy into what the Mets are doing. And, and ultimately what we will learn is this is part of the season. There are always those ebbs and flows. It's going to look good at some points, just like it's going to look awful because in any given weekend, you can have a team come in and just beat the pants off you. And then, Hey, you can end up doing the same thing to somebody else. But after going through everything from 2023 to start off 2024 like that, just brutal, brutal. Every single time the Mets hit a hard ball, it was in a Brewer's glove. The Brewers were stealing bases at will. First on Francisco Alves, but really on, on Sunday against Omar Navarro, everyone had a green light to go to second. I mean, it was just constant. Bryce Terang stole four bases in this series. Jackson Churio was maddening to watch, but also... Kind of cool, too. It, it sucked because it was happening as the Mets. But, man, that kid's going to be good for a long time. The athleticism we saw on display, any ball that was hit in the infield was you know, a, a potential base hit for him. Just has so much speed. See him play in right field. It was a, a real showing of athleticism. And really, the entire Brewers team just felt like they were varsity versus JV. They just seemed like they were more athletic and quicker than the New York Mets. The Mets took a lead in, on opening day, bottom of the second, Starling Marte hit a home run, which is the last time I felt joy. Uh, <laughs> top of the fifth inning, the Mets gave up the lead in that game, and they did not lead again for the rest of the series. And on Sunday, more of the same. Tyler McGill gives up a run in the first inning, although it was unearned due to a catcher's interference. Second inning, though, he gave up an earned run on a double by Jackson Cheerio. Third inning. Could have gone a lot worse. So overall, I look at Tyler McGill's start, and it, it wasn't too bad. Four innings pitched, two runs allowed. But in that third inning, it could have been awful. So first he strikes at William Contreras. Then he walks Christian Yelich. Then he walks Willie Adamas. Then he hit Oliver Dunn on what would have been ball four. So you pretty much call that another walk. So essentially, walk the bases loaded. All spring, I commented on how Tyler McGill – was you know, attacking the strike zone. And then at the end of spring, it, he started to lose it. To see that lack of control a little bit come back, not great. He also exited the game early with shoulder soreness. So another thing that we'll talk about in the next segment a little bit more, but another bad sign from this weekend. Um, and, and even with all that said, he might have had the best start for the Mets this weekend. And, and he did because he got out of that base of load jam by getting Reese Hoskins to hit a dribbler. He came in on it. Fielded it, flipped it to Nervais at home. Nervais threw it to first. One, two, three, double play. That got the Mets out of a really big jam. 
And that could have been great to, to limit the Brewers to two runs. But the Mets couldn't score. They scored once in the second inning. Francisco Alvarez hit a double, and Tyrone Taylor drove him with a base hit, but that was it. They only had four opportunities in this game with runners in scoring position, and that was the only one where they got a hit. Now, after McGill exited with the shoulder soreness, Johan Ramirez came in, and, and the very typical, uh, you're about to get suspended, so give us all you got game. Basically, for those of you who don't know, I mentioned Mendoza got suspended before his first win. He got suspended for a game, and Ramirez got suspended for three games due to throwing at Reese Hoskins. Why they suspended Mendoza, I do not know, especially because I'm still not entirely sure that was intentional. Regardless, the Mets appealed the suspension, or Ramirez appealed the suspension. Whether it gets upheld or not, basically what that meant was he was allowed to pitch in this game. Probably what will happen now after he throws three innings is they'll just say, all right, we accept the suspension, and he'll be out for the series against the Tigers. That's that's probably what's going to happen here. And they just they rode him for three innings. He gave up two runs. He saved the rest of the bullpen a little bit and set the Mets up to hopefully have a good series against the Tigers. But there's not much we can take from this that was positive. I will touch on a couple of players in the next segment that did have a good series. Alvarez, Alonzo, Marte, and Beatty. Those are really the four. But what happened offensively in this series is they got nothing from Jeff McNeil, Francisco Lindor, and Brandon Nemo. Combined, the three of them are what? Three for... That's 25, three for 36. Jeff McNeil, one for 11. No walks, no strikeouts. Um, just hit into a lot of outs. And I don't think he even hit into hard outs. I mean, he was just flying out a lot. Not, not much that you could take from McNeil's weekend that was positive. Francisco Lindor is one for 12 with a walk and two strikeouts. There was some occasions where he did line out and hit the ball pretty hard. So I'm sure he'll come around, just like I'm sure that Brandon Nimmo will come around. Nimmo went one for 13, didn't look great. He struck out five times. So he he looked the worst of the three this weekend. But ultimately, I have all the confidence in the world that Nimmo's going to produce, as well as Lindor. Jeff McNeil, I'm a little more concerned about. It's coming off a down year. We're not going to look at one series and say, oh, he can't hit. But right now, when they don't have J.D. Martinez, you got McNeil batting cleanup in some of these games, and that's just not working. I think the, the Mets have to make an immediate move here Put the hot bat in the cleanup spot. That's Francisco Alvarez. Bat him after Pete Alonso. Give Pete some real protection. Those are the two guys that are hitting right now. And you need Alvarez to get up as many times as possible the way he's swinging the bat. So that's one real note that they got to try to clean that up. But Jeff just not looking good so far. And really just the three of them, uh, in a lot of ways, tank the Mets offense. When you have those three guys batting, you know, one for Nimmo, two Lindor, four at times for McNeil and none of them are getting hits, it's going to crater your, your lineup. And on top of that, even though Tyrone Taylor did get a big RBI hit, so give him some credit, you look at what him and Harrison Bader did combined, and they basically split playing time. Bader got seven at-bats, Taylor got six. They went two for 13 together, one walk, three strikeouts. So you add them into the mix of those other three guys. And what is that? One, two, three, five hits in... <sighs> 49 at bats, if I'm not mistaken, which is what just above 100. I don't know, bad at math, but regardless, <laughs> regardless, the point stands you have four spots in your lineup that weren't producing, and that's not even mentioning Omar Nervaez not doing anything in his start, DJ Stewart not doing anything in his at bats. Zach Short was okay, but he went one for three. So they need to hit more, especially with the pitching that they're going to get. And now that we're seeing that pitching on display over a series and you're actually watching these guys go up start at the start, the loss of Kodai Sanga is felt. And the Mets need to hope that Sean Mania throws the ball really well to start the series against the Tigers. Same thing goes for Hauser. And you hope that you get a better starts. If you get better starts moving forward from Katana and Severino because – you could feel the season slip away from the Mets early this year with the state of their rotation. Um, if these guys don't deliver and they believe in them too, and, and I'm not going to give up on one series, but man, did it look awful. So, all right, I digressed. I got all my, my, my rage out, my frustration. It's out there. That's it. I'm sure you're all feeling it too. As Mets fans, second segment, we're going to talk about some positives 
But also, we got to touch on Tyler McGill being scratched due to shoulder soreness and then an MRI. So we'll, we'll go over that as well, what the Mets could do if he goes down. I'll break down both of those things in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The sports calendar is loaded and FanDuel's making it even more exciting to get in on the action because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks that you can bet on the tournament, uh, MLB, NBA, NHL, and so much more. Hey, if you think the Mets are just due, right? They just lost three in a row. They're due to win a game, right? Bet $5 on them on the money line. If you win that, $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet a big win again. $5 for $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Are you struggling to close deals? B2B selling is tougher than ever, and that's why I want to tell you about LinkedIn Sales Navigator. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage high-value customers, helps you drive higher revenue, and increase sales performance. Sales Navigator helps you target the right buyers, surface key signals, and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers that are most likely to convert. Fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform, Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with the people that matter. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash locked on. That's linkedin.com slash locked on for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash locked on and get started. Before we get back to the negative with Tyler McGill's potential injury, let's skew positive for a second here. The Mets got a really good series out of four of their regulars. I'll start with Pete Alonso because I refrained from mentioning him in a tweet that I sent out at the end of the game on Sunday. A lot of people commented Pete on it. The reason why I just pointed out Alvarez, Marte, and Beatty is because those guys are players that I liked going into the year. I thought that Marte would bounce back. I felt like Brett Beatty could enjoy a breakout Francisco Alvarez. I've been hyping up more than anyone, but Pete Alonso is the known commodity. So when Pete Alonso goes four for 11 in a series and hits a home run, I'm not really surprised or I hate to say not impressed, but it's just, he has a standard and he met that standard. And he also played great at first base. I felt made some nice picks around the bag. He had one double play where it was just a shot hit at him above his head, sort of a reach up. Look what I found. And he was able to, to touch the back and get a double play on it. So Pete did his thing. Awesome to see. Uh, and I'm sure that'll continue to carry over. But Francisco Alvarez is the best part of this series. For one, he went five for 10. So he was batting 500. He walked, which was good to see. Um, he had a home run and a double. He just attacked every at bat. Looked confident in, in the box. Looked like. He was itching to get in there each time, and, and it was an opportunity to help his team win. And, and he just affirmed all of the belief that I had in him throughout the offseason. I think he's going to have such a big year, and this was not going to push me off that position at all. So it, it was great to see Alvarez really show up in every game and, and produce, and, and hopefully that continues. And what I loved about this game, too, two starts behind the dish, one at DH. If you got to... Stick J.D. Martinez in left field for all I care. <laughs> I'm not actually serious about that one, but go with me for a second. Whatever you got to do to get Alvarez in the box as much as possible. I'm sure he'll tell you he can catch seven days a week. He can't. You get you got to get him some rest. But if you can figure out a way to align J.D. Martinez's rest with when Alvarez needs to get off his feet, I'm sure there'll be some games where they just have to sit him down. But I want Alvarez's bat in the lineup as much as possible, particularly with how he's swinging right now. And, and as I mentioned in the last segment, until you get J.D. Martinez, I don't see any reason why you hold off on it. Slide him up to clean up. Let him bat behind Pete Alonso. You know, put, I don't know if you want to stack that many righties. I guess the one, the one issue with doing that is Starling Marte is also swinging a good bat. So if you were to bat Alvarez fourth, then all of a sudden you're batting McNeil fifth, and then Marte probably has to bat sixth. If you want to put Marte clean up, I guess. But to me, 
Alvarez is the guy to put clean up right now. And, and for anything, just stack all your righties. I don't even care. Um, <laughs> bat Marte right after him and put McNeil down the lineup. They probably won't do that, but uh, that, that's just judging off of the weekend we just saw. I'm sure the Mets won't overact the way I am, but hey, I'm still a little hot, man. It was a, it was a rough weekend. Marte went three for 10. He, even when he got out, he put together good at bats, seeing a lot of pitches, looking like Starling Marte in the box. Uh, somebody said from the Mets, when the lights turn on, Marte will be Marte. And that's what we saw, though those were all day games this week. And then Brett Beatty, I, I liked his approach. He did have a couple ugly strikeouts. Um, you know, There's one in particular that, that jumps to mind. I didn't mark his, strike, his strikeouts in this series. In my notes here, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. But um, there was one where I think it was a 3-2 count, and I just knew there was a slider coming. And I was like, yeah, here's a strikeout. And there was a, a, a slider nowhere near the zone against a lefty on Sunday, and Beatty just swung through it. He had four Ks, so so not the best um, when it comes to the strikeouts. He strike out four times and eight at bats, but he had that big home run. He got you know two hits. I felt like there was good at bats there. So uh, overall, I think Brett Beatty had a good enough series here, enough that I'm excited to see how we can build off of it. Right. With all that said. They're going to need more out of him, and they're going to need those three guys and Alonzo, Alvarez, and Marte to stay hot, and they're going to need a lot more out of Lindor, Nimmo, and McNeil. And look, it's one series. All those guys can turn it on, and the Mets could put up 23 runs in a three-game series against the Tigers. Let's circle down that number. You think it happens, 23 runs? Probably not. But hey, if it does, um, I don't know. Maybe I'll send a listener $50. How about that? You heard it here first. Mets score 23 runs this series. Uh, we'll talk about that series in the next segment, but before we get into it, we got an injury to discuss already. Tyler McGill, shoulder, shoulder soreness. Try to say that 10 times fast. Shoulder soreness, shoulder soreness, shoulder soreness. Uh, you know, he ends up exiting after four innings, and we'll see now. We'll see what happens, what comes back from the MRI. If he does need a 10-day IL stint, and they just want him to rest a little bit, I could see the Mets, you know, putting them through the IL right now or putting them on the aisle right now just because it allows you to add another reliever for this series against the Tigers. And then next Saturday, which is when McGill would be due, you can start Jose Buda or Joe Lucchese. You could pick both of those guys started in Syracuse, uh, Lucchese on opening day in AAA on Friday, Buda on Sun on Saturday. Um, Vassal started on Sunday. So you could have either of those guys ready to go for next Saturday. So I would wonder if that's what they're going to ultimately do here. Um, there was, of course, also the thought that maybe they'd want a six starter to bump Jose Quintana down. They do that. I don't know that that would um, obviously lengthen the rotation a little bit, but again, you'd need an arm over the weekend. So I imagine let Quintana start on regular rest uh, for the last game of that series. That's what's been announced up to this point. And I wonder if they go to a Buda or Lucchese so that they could, for one, let McGill get some rest on that shoulder. We still don't know how bad it is. I'm sure we'll learn more on Monday. Uh, but more importantly, to give them an extra reliever uh, for this upcoming series here. Speaking of Triple S, since I did mention it, Mike Vassell did not pitch well on Sunday. Gave up four and didn't make it out of the third inning. We've yet to see Christian Scott or Dom Hamill pitch. I imagine they are. Next due up here uh, to start off the week. Mark Vientos, three for nine with a home run and three walks to one strikeout. So a good series for him. Luis Alacuna and Drew Gilbert, they both homer. They went back-to-back -back on opening day, if I'm not mistaken. But combined, they went three for 25 in this series. So not a great start at, at the AAA level for them. I also wanted to mention that I wonder at what point in the season with the Mets – think to try to give the rotation a shot in the arm and go to a Christian Scott. It's not going to happen really early. Don't expect it in April, but let's just say it, you go through April and the rotation is struggling and Scott puts up three or four really dynamite starts in AAA. I do wonder if at some point the Mets would be motivated to call up a top prospect to help a rotation that might desperately need it until they get Kodai Senga back. But for now, let's hope the Mets can flush this first series 
Detroit comes into town. If they can just play well here, get themselves on track, uh, we'll be a lot more optimistic throughout the rest of the week. I want to preview that series in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. What I love about my Fire TV stick is I got my whole setup in the living room, all the password saves, all, all the subscriptions I'm logged into. When I go on the road, unplug that bad boy, take it with me, and I can watch everything in the hotel. So it's great for that convenience. Fire TV also recently added the Fire TV channels that deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. And that includes all of us at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues in college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on fire TV. The Detroit Tigers are coming into town after sweeping the Chicago White Sox in their first series. And it also took place in Chicago. So I guess the Tigers home opener is delayed until next weekend for the Mets. The hope is you can find your way to beat up a team that wasn't the best last year, but also a team that is on the upswing. I mean, they certainly made moves this offseason to try to contend. And they have some interesting pieces in their lineup. You look up and down, Parker Meadows leading off for them this weekend. Uh, he's an exciting young player who's going to give them a lot in, in the in center field defensively. Um, Spencer Torkelson had a nice breakout at the end of last season. Look at the season overall. It doesn't jump out, but down the stretch, he got a lot better. Kerry Carpenter, a really quiet player as far as um, the attention he gets, but his game's not quiet. He's a really nice player. Riley Green. Uh, he is DHing, or at least he did on Sunday. I believe he might be coming back from an interest. So that might be something uh, that we'll see throughout this upcoming series as well. But he is another young player. He's got a lot of promise. Mark Canna is a Tiger, so he gets to return to City Field. Do we get a Canna? Um, what do they call it? The montage? You get the video montage on, on Mark Canna? I think he should get one, right? Why not? Uh, so he'll come back. Javi Baez still on the Tigers. We'll see if he um, turns into what he was on, on the Mets for that, that half of the season where he was great playing in front of the New York fans. We hope not. We hope he's more of what he's been in Detroit since he signed that big contract, which is a very easy strikeout. Not that I guess he wasn't that at times with the Mets too, but nowhere near what he's been in Detroit. So we'll see. We'll see what the Tigers bring here for the Mets. Um, looking at the pitching matchups, you got Reese Olsen going up against Sean Manaya. Olsen had a nice year last year, uh, 399 ERA in his first big league season. That was in just over 100 innings pitched. Uh, so definitely a guy that has had some success, and I don't think that he faced the Mets last year, if I'm not mistaken, because um, they faced the Tigers early in the season. So I could be wrong there, but I don't believe that they did see Olsen. So probably the first time that a lot of these hitters We'll see him in this game. Uh, game two of the series will be Casey Mize versus Adrian Hauser. If Mize sounds familiar. He was the number one overall pick in the draft back in 2018. Uh, hasn't pitched since 2022. Finally healthy. Looked really good this spring. The Velo's back. He could be a, a really tough uh, guy to face, although they did slot him in that fifth spot in their rotation for a reason. So there is some volatility there. Um, don't know what version you're going to get as he's still – trying to just get his career back on track. But again, he does have some good stuff. He'll be going up against Adrian Hauser in his first Mets start. So we'll see how Hauser looks. Um, and then the final game of the series, not a good draw for the Mets. Tariq Skubal going up against Jose Quintana. Skubal threw at six shot at innings on opening day. Just six strikeouts to no walks. Last year, he had a 2.80 ERA in 15 starts. He's a sneaky dark horse side young pick for a lot of people. In the American League, a really, really tough lefty. Uh, we'll see what line the Mets put out there. To me, that's a start where I'd protect Brett Beatty. I know he hit the home run, but you also saw what he looked like uh, today against the lefty out of the pen. 
there was a really good story that they uh, broke down. Steve Gelps did, I believe, during the game on Sunday, talking about um, how Brett Beatty prepared to, to, to come up big in that pinch hit opportunity on Saturday, how he knew that if he was going to face anybody, it'd probably be Hobie Milner. And he studied him that whole time and thought he would get a first pitch sinker. They asked him earlier in the game to get up and he, he did and he didn't end up you know getting that, that opportunity. So he had to wait until later on and he stayed ready. Francisco Lindor praised that mental approach and how it shows growth in Beatty's game. And then he knew what he was going to get. He saw it and he didn't miss it. And he crushed that home run and, and gave the Mets a chance in that game on Saturday. So, I wouldn't be mad if the Mets started him against Scoobal on uh, will that be on Wednesday, but at the same time, that's a tough, tough matchup for him. And I would get it if the Mets went to the Zach Short lineup with Tyrone Taylor in right field and Starling Marte at DH. But we'll see what they decide to do. They also could that game decide to go to well, it, it, you know, I don't want Nervais against Scoobal either. So who knows? Maybe we see uh, Alvarez DH one of these first two games. And then uh, you know, catch the final one, or maybe we see him catch all three. They're all night games, so there's no day game after night game situation here. Um, so maybe he does just catch all three games, particularly with the off day on Thursday. I actually, actually hope that is what the Mets decide to do here. Anyway, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked On Mets. I'll be back tomorrow to break down hopefully the first Mets victory of this season. Uh, but we'll just have to wait and see how long that is delayed until we can finally say, hey, Carlos Mendoza, congratulations. You got your first one in the books. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Trying to make a push to 9,000 subs. So appreciate all of you who subscribe. Uh, you can follow me on X at Ficklestein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. After your second listen or your second watch, head over to YouTube and check out the first ever 24-7 streaming channel covering everything in the world of sports. Of course, I'm talking about Locked On Sports Today. There are local experts from each team and our league-wide experts from each league. By Locked On Sports Today streaming 24-7 on YouTube.